should we? Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's good. Let's awesome. Go. Well, um, thanks everyone. Um, we're delighted to have Ashley Edwards here today as our um, invited speaker. Um, Ashley got her PhD from Georgia Tech working with uh, Charles Isbell. She's done a lot of work in reinforcement learning. She's been at um, Uber AI Labs and will be joining DeepMind um, in about a week, it sounds like, which is an exciting new adventure. She's also given a number of invited talks, um, including uh, an invited talk at the Women in Machine Learning um, workshop at uh, NeurIPS last year. Um, and we're really excited to hear what she is going to tell us today about learning to act from observations. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the introduction and um, thank you again for inviting me to give this talk. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and yeah, thank, every, thank you for, um, for joining me during this talk. So I'm excited to be talking about my recent works on how we can train agents to act from observation. Um, so as humans, we're very lucky to be able to learn from many different sources of information. So for example, we can learn to dance by uh, playing video games or to cook by watching YouTube videos or make origami diagrams um, by studying different figures. And so I think one interesting question that we should ask ourselves is how can we allow agents to learn from sources such, like, uh, such as this? Because if we can figure this out, then it might allow us to train agents using the vast amount of information that's available to us to learn from. So one thing we can try to consider is just uh, what are some of the properties that allow us to learn from these different sorts of tasks? Um, so firstly, we're often able to learn across domains. Um, so for solving some sort of task, it often takes place um, when we're looking at how to accomplish it um, in a different environment than our own. And we have to solve some sort of correspondence problem to figure out how to solve the task. Um, next, we're capable of imitating from observation. Uh, and so often when we're watching somebody perform some task, we need to infer which actions that they took in order to figure out how to solve a task ourselves. Um, and finally, although this isn't necessarily modeled in these different examples I've shown here, um, we're often capable of learning from imperfect observations. And so if we want somebody to perform some task and we want to do it ourselves, um, maybe that person didn't perform it optimally, but we're often able to improve upon um, what we've observed in order to uh, perform the task um, better. So during this talk, I'm going to focus on these latter two points of how agents can um, imitate from observation as well as learn from observations and perform better than um, its demonstrators. Although I do think cross-domain learning is definitely important as well. And I've done some work in this area um, as well. Uh, and so during this talk, just, just a very simple um, outline, I thought it'd be useful for you to know. <laughs> um, so I'm going to first start off talking about just some of the background behind um, some of the work that I've been done. Then I'll describe some of my work on imitation from observation, um, and then learning from observation, and then I'll just talk about um, briefly uh, about some of the future directions um, for imitation and learning from observation. Okay, so uh, throughout this series and um, you know your reinforcement learning careers, you've probably seen a diagram that looks something similar to this, uh, where you have an agent that's taking actions and it's interacting with its environment and it's receiving rewards. Um, and it's, what it's trying to do is it's trying to learn a policy that's going to say in a given state, which action should I take? Um, and what you wanna learn is what actions will allow me to maximize my long-term um, future discounted return often represented through uh, these Q values here. Um, and a lot of the magic behind reinforcement learning comes from the reward signal. So if you can, you know, if you can come up with a good reward function, then reinforcement learning agents are often able to solve a lot of really interesting problems. Um, but I, I think some of the magic sort of disappears when you when you actually have to go off and make these reinforcement learning agents yourself. Um, so uh, Anka talked a, a bit about this during um, her talk on Monday, but um, so reward signals can often be very, very difficult to specify. Um, humans often don't know how to specify reward functions. And even if you come up with something that seems reasonable, um, the agent can learn to exploit it. Uh, so that's one problem. Another problem, problem is that uh, reward signals are often sparse. So even if you specify it correctly, it might take a really long time for the agent to figure out how to solve the task just from this sparse signal. 
um, or it might not ever be able to figure out on its own. So one solution to this sort of problem is that we can have a human in the loop that's going to show the agent how to accomplish the task. And so what they're going to say is in this state, this is the action that you should take. And so um, basically we want this person to give some demonstrations for how to solve the task. And so this sort of um, learning setup is often known as imitation learning, uh, where you're going to be given demonstrations represented um, as a sequence of states and actions. And again, these actions are going, going to be coming from um, some demonstrator, um, often somebody that knows how to solve the task. Uh, and given this data, we're going to try to learn something. So we can learn, for example, a policy. And I guess the simplest or one of the simplest um, ways to learn a policy is through something called behavioral coding. That's going to say um, in this state, just predict which action um, the uh, demonstrator took using something like supervised learning. We can also learn uh, reward um, functions from, from demonstrations as well as values. Uh, but if we wanna have the sort of world where you know we just have agents going off and maybe watching videos or observing other agents, maybe animals, other robots, then we're often not going to have access to these actions. Um, and so what I wanna just consider is how can we train agents to learn only from a sequence of states coming from something like a video, um, where again, we're not going to have access to actions. And so that approach is um, typically known as imitation from observation. And there are a couple of different uh, approaches for doing imitation from observation. One is to learn a reward function um, and then use that reward function for training reinforcement learning agents. Another is to learn a dynamics model. And, and what I mean is um, that you can place the agent within its environment, learn something about how um, the dynamics work. So you might say like in this state, if I ended up in this state, this is the action that, um, that was taken. And then you can use those sort of dynamics models to predict which actions the demonstrator took from your sequence of states. Um, one problem with these kinds of approaches um, though is that they require a lot of environment interaction. So you can imagine doing reinforcement learning in the environment, learning these dynamics models um, might require a lot of environment interaction. And, and so what I wanna consider in the rest of this talk, and um, so I'm gonna discuss um, different techniques for this, is how we can actually try to learn as much as we can offline from the observations alone before the agent ever takes any steps within the environment. Okay. Um, so imagine your friend is playing a video game that you've never seen before. Uh, so by watching them play, we can often get an idea of how the game works. Um, so in this example, we see that, um, you know, there's these different enemies that we need to avoid. Um, we need to jump over these different obstacles. And there's a coin at the end of a platform that we need to reach. Um, and so once we watch our friend play, you know, after we pick up the controller, even though we've never played the game before, um, we can often just play really quickly once we've figured out the actual controls. And that's because we figured out this sort of, um, let's call it a policy <laughs> that our friend is following. And um, we've, we've figured out what the, um, the point of the game is just by watching our friend play. And so that was the idea behind our um, recent work, imitating latent policies from observation or ILPO where we're going to be given a sequence of observations. Um, and again, remember, we don't have access to actions in this scenario. And from the sequence of observations, we're going to try to learn a latent policy. Um, so what I mean is this is going to be like this sort of watch step where we're going to watch these observations and figure out how the task should be solved, even though we don't know the names of the actions. Um, then once we learn that latent policy, we're going to place the agent into the environment um, just so that it can take a few steps so that it can try to align um, its, its notion of um, these latent policies or latent actions to the real actions that it can take in the world. Okay, um, so let's say that we've sampled the state from our demonstration set. From that state, we might observe two different kinds of transitions. Um, one would be something that looked like moving to the right, or something that looked like jumping in the air, but again, we don't know the names of these different transitions. So we're going to define a latent, act, latent action Z 
as being something that caused one of these transitions to occur. Um, but again, we don't actually know that these are the names of those different transitions. Um, and so this can refer to um, or correspond to the real kinds of actions that the agent can take in the world, such as moving to the right or jumping in the air. Um, but it also might model some other transition that's not necessarily modeled by our action space, um, such as bumping into the wall. So we're going to define a latent policy as being the probability that our um, demonstrator would take one of these latent actions in this state here. Um, and so that, that's what our latent policy is going to be. Um, and so the way that we're going to, to learn that is, um, so we introduce something called a latent policy network. Um, so again, I, I wanna point out that, oh yeah, sure. I just had a quick question, which is, do you know the cardinality of the latent um, space, like the latent number of actions? Does someone tell you there's only 10 or um, is that also inferred? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it is, it, it's, it's a hyperparameter. Um, so we assume like maybe we have the same number of latent actions as the actual underlying actions. Um, in the action space, but it turns out that it's sometimes better to reduce the number of latents or increase, um, you know, because sometimes the demonstrator, you know, like if it's a platform game, the demonstrator will never move to the left, for example, or rarely move to the left. And so we might just say, well, just forget about that latent action. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that it's, I think it's a good start to assume that it's the same number of actions, but it's definitely something that, that can be tweaked. Um, yeah. Um, and so, okay, so let's see how we can actually learn this latent policy. Um, so we introduced this latent policy network. And what we're going to try to do is in each state, we're going to try to predict each possible next state that can occur um, given one of these latent actions. So we're going to predict, for example, moving to the right, jumping into the air. Um, and I should point out that these latent actions aren't being learned. Um, so these are just going to be um, a fixed input into the network. Now, while we're learning this generative model that again is trying to predict each next state, we're also going to learn a policy that's going to say, what is the probability um, that our demonstrator took one of these latent actions in each of these states? Okay, so let's go into more details about how we actually learn that. Um, so let's say we've sampled a state and next state from our demonstration set, which again, doesn't have, um, doesn't consist of actions. And so again, we're going to try to train a generative model to predict each possible next state given a latent action. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to find the predicted next state that looks the most like the next state that we observed within our demonstration and then we're going to try to minimize the distance between um, those two states. And the reason that we're going to try to find the one that's closest to, um, excuse me, closest to the um, observed next state rather than um, just penalizing all of them at the same time is that this is going to free up the generative model to try to learn about each of the different kinds of modes within um, the, the distribution. So it's going to allow it to basically try to predict each um, possible next state um, and basically make each transition as good as possible such that if we observe that actual transition we just minimize the distance between those two things. Um, and so that's how we train our generative model that's predicting next states. Um, but the reason we have that, it, um, the only reason we need that generative model is because we need it to help us learn our latent policy. Um, so now let's talk about how we actually get this policy because that's what we actually care about. Um, so again, let's say that we've sampled a state from our demonstration set. Um, so we might observe the following distribution from that state. So let's say with probability 0.5, our um, demonstrator moves to the right, um, jumps in the air with probability 0.5, and stays, zero, um, stays still with probability zero. Uh, so if we wanted to compute the expected next state under this distribution, you would get something that looks like this. And so what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to learn, um, our latent policy is going to try to assign um, uh, probabilities to each of our next state predictions, such that, uh, so that if we took the expected next state under that distribution, it would look similar to the expected next states under our experts distribution. Um, and so that's basically what we're going to do. We're going to be computing an expectation 
Um, and so what we um, do is we just multiply our, uh, our next state prediction by the probability of it occurring and then sum up um, sum over our, our latents here. And then we just, again, we're going to um, minimize the distance between our observed next state and now this expected next state. Um, and this is how we're going to actually be training our um, latent policy. Okay, are there any questions before I move on? <laughs> so I know this is probably a lot. <laughs> okay, um, great. So um, once we learn this latent policy, uh, we're now we basically need to figure out how can we convert that over to actually real action. Um, and so we basically just need to place the agent within the environment to again, uh, allow it to take a few steps to align these latent actions um, with the real sorts of actions that it can take in the world. And so what we're going to do is we're going to introduce this action remapping network that's going to take in a state in one of our latent actions. And it's going to basically say this latent action likely corresponds to this real action um, in the world. And the way that this is going to work, so now this is the online step. Um, so before we were learning our latent policy offline, now we have to place the agent online in order to um, do this alignment. Um, and so what we do is we um, have the agent take an action in the state in order to get um, another the, the next state here. Uh, and what we're going to do is again, we're going to use our generative model to predict each possible next state um, that can happen from that state after taking one of these latent actions. We're going to again find the prediction that looks the most like the next state that we've just observed. Um, and then what we can say is, well, that latent action that I plugged into my generative model likely corresponds to the action that I actually took that led me to that state. Um, and then so we can just do this sort of relabeling here um, and try to train this using something like a cross entropy law. Um, so just to sort of summarize how control is going to work, um, so once we learn these things, we can place the agent within its environment. Um, it's going to, excuse me, I need to real quick. Um, it's going to select the latent action um, following the latent policy. And then it's going to, um, you know, the latent policy is going to point in the incorrect direction probably because it's been labeled incorrectly. Um, but then we can plug it into our relabeling function that's going to say, well, you didn't mean move left, you actually meant move right. Um, and then we can just follow um, that relabeled policy. And that's basically how um, the algorithm works. Uh, so in our experiments, we compare against an approach known as behavioral cloning from observation. Um, and so this is an imitation from observation approach that's um, given a sequence of observations. Uh, and so what it's going to do is it's going to try to um, learn an inverse dynamics model. So basically it's going to try to learn this online. So you place the agent within the environment and it's going to say, given a state and a next state, it's going to try to predict which action was taken. Then what it can do or what it does is that it uses that label um, to predict given a state and next state coming from my demonstrations, again, something like a video, this is the most likely action that was taken here. And then it can use that to say, okay, well, now I'm going to train a behavioral cloning um, policy given my state and this sort of inverse dynamics action that I'm predicting. Um, and, and so what it's going to try to do is learn a policy using that. Uh, the problem with this, um, or I guess one difficulty that you might have is that um, it's going to be learning this inverse dynamics model at the same time that it's learning the policy and it's having to collect data um, from that policy that it's learning. Um, and so you can imagine that this can be kind of difficult, especially if you have, um, you know, high dimensional problems. And so uh, one of the benefits of um, our approach, or which we call ILCO, is that it learns our, this latent policy offline. So we already have an idea what the policy is. And we just have to figure out how to correspond the latent actions to the real ones. Um, so we don't have to learn a full blown policy online. And so we ran this in a few different environments. The first, um, the first environments were these classic control problems. So we have a mountain car where you're trying, or the agent needs to balance this mountain car, or sorry, this cart pull. <laughs> um, so yeah, in cart pull, you're balancing a pull. Um, in acrobat, you're trying to swing this thing, arm thing <laughs> up to the top. 
And then in mountain car, you're trying to swing back and forth in order to get to the top of the mountain. Um, and so I should point out that all of the states in this environment are represented through vectors. Um, and so these experiments are just showing how our, our approach does against behavioral cloning from observation or BCO. Um, when you measure the amount of episodic reward it gets per um, environment interaction. And our approach is shown um, in purple and BCO is shown in blue. Um, and so you can see here that we're able to perform better than BCO in these approaches. Um, basically we're able to um, learn with fewer environment interactions because again, we're learning this latent policy offline. And so after just 50 steps of the agent interacting with its environment, it was able to learn how to balance this pole here um, and swing this acrobat to the top, although I won't make you, you know, sit here and watch that happen. <laughs> um, just trust me on it. <laughs> um, and then we also run this in this environment um, called Coin Run. So again, a Coin Run, the agent needs to navigate to the end of the platform in order to um, obtain a coin. And so now our states are going to be represented through images um, so again, you can imagine that it can be a little bit more tricky to try to do something like um, behavioral cloning from observation because it's learning this inverse dynamics model and policy um, at the same time, whereas we're going to learn the policy offline. Um, and so we ran this in a couple of different instantiations of the game. One, of, one was when the coin was like really close and then uh, another was when the coin was sort of separated, separated by this pit. Um, so it might be a little bit more difficult for it to reach the coin. Ashley, there's um, and this was just there's a question. Q and A. Sorry to interrupt. Um, from Ali, who asked, are the environmental interactions in the learning curves just for the action remapping, remapping portion, or also for the offline learning? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so this is just for the um, action remapping portion. Um, so when it's um, interacting online. Um, so yeah, there, there. I, I would say that there's definitely a trade off. Um, so. Our approach requires a lot of um, data in order to actually learn these latent policies, um, but that data is offline. Um, so we basically assume we're more okay with having, um, having the demonstrator have to give us a little bit more data than we are with the agent having to um, interact with the environment. Um, but yeah, there's definitely like a bit of a balance between those two things. And there was a second, thanks. And there's a second question from Aaron saying um, uh, re regarding ILPO, do you see any obvious way forward to learn the number of latent actions in a non-parametric fashion, maybe with things like stick breaking neural network models or stuff like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we haven't worked with, uh, with trying to learn the number of latents um, other than like trying to tune our hyperparameters. Um, there is a very similar paper that, that came out like at the same time almost um, called learning, learning what to do before you do it, I think. Um, this is uh, out of Berkeley and they do something similar. Um, I don't remember if they're also assuming that the number of latents is a hyperparameter, but it's, a, it's another, I guess, approach to take a look at, um, into if you're curious about. Um, maybe that's how we, if, we, <laughs> if we learned it or not, I'm not actually sure, um, but we haven't, we haven't looked into it. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, so when we compared, or actually, are, are there any other questions before I move on? Okay. Um, yeah, so we compared, um, again, against behavioral playing from observation um, and these uh, coin run uh, tasks. And you can see, again, that we're able to perform better um, than behavioral cloning from observation if you're measuring the uh, reward that you get per environment interaction. Uh, and so finally, what I just want to say is that um, sometimes we can get a little bit lucky when we're doing the relabeling. Um, and so uh, after just zero steps, for example, some of our latent actions can be relabeled to the right, the correct actions. Um, so you see here, the agent is actually able to sort of move towards the goal, um, even though it's never take, taken any steps within the environment. Um, you can see it's like kind of confused about how to jump, but it sort of like gets in the direction of where the goal is going. Um, and then after just 200 steps of in interacting with the environment, um, it was actually able to solve the task. Because again, we're going to be learning a lot of what we need to learn um, about how to act from, um, from the observation before the agent takes any actions in the environment. Um, 
So in conclusion, what I've just shown in this work is that um, latent policies can be learned directly from observation. And if we want to train an agent to imitate, um, it's just going to require a few steps of trying to map our latent actions to the real actions that she can take in the world. Um, and if you're interested in this work, our code is available online. Um, so one thing uh, that we didn't consider is, um, so we assumed that our demonstrations were coming from somebody who knew, who knew what they were doing. Um, so now what I wanna consider is what's going to happen if our demonstrations are actually suboptimal. Um, and, and by suboptimal, I mean actually what if they're kind of terrible. Um, so if you're going to use demonstrations such as this for uh, most typical imitation from observation approaches, uh, including ILPO, um, your agent would typically do kind of terribly um, because again, they assume that you have an expert that knows what they're doing. Um, and so what I wanna discuss is that we can actually learn, we can still learn from this sort of data um, using this new approach um, that we've, we've recently um, put out, which is estimating QSS with deep deterministic dynamics gradients or D3G. Um, and so often if you wanted to learn an optimal policy from um, suboptimal data, you can use an off policy learner such as Q-learning, um, where again, you know, you have your agent and you're trying to learn a policy that maximizes your long-term expected return, um, which is being represented by your Q values. But if we want to use an approach like this to um, learn from observational data where we don't have access to action, um, we need to you know, figure out how we can reformulate our Q function. Um, and so what we do in this work is that we actually say, well, now we're going to represent our Q values as being the long-term expected return for moving to a neighboring state that's going to maximize our QSS values. Um, and so this is how we represent our value function. And now instead of having a policy pi, we're going to have this model tau that's going to say in a given state, can you propose which next state I should move to that's going to maximize my long-term expected return? Um, and then, and so in order to figure out which action I should take, we're also going to learn an inverse dynamics model that's going to say, um, given a state and my proposed next state, tell me which action will get me there. Um, but the ben benefit of this part where we're going to be learning QSS values is that it doesn't require access to action. And so we can learn it completely offline um, in an off-policy off manner, manner from observation alone. But before I get to that, I think it would be useful to actually talk about the online scenario where our agent is actually going to be taking actions and interacting with this environment. Um, and I, I think this is just going to be useful so that we can get a little bit more familiar with some of the properties of QSS. Okay, so just to make it a little bit more clear, um, the main differences between QSS and QSA is that QSA is going to be um, trying to learn the reward plus the discounted future return for selecting um, an action that maximizes our QSA values, where as we're going to be selecting the next state that maximizes our um, QSS values. And then the way that control is going to work is that um, given a state, we're going to now select the state with the largest value. Um, coming, and this is going to be coming from our um, model tau, whereas typically you would select the action um, that gives you the largest QSA value. Um, and then we plug that into our inverse dynamics model, which is going to say here's um, the action that would allow that transition to occur. And then you can just follow that action here. Um, so now let's talk about how we can actually learn our QSS values. Um, and so for now, I'm going to consider the tabular setting where our QSS values are going to be represented by a table. Um, and so let's say, um, so, so what we're going to try to learn is, um, again, our reward plus our discounted future return for moving to our neighboring state that maximizes our QSS values. And this can be learned in a similar way that we would learn um, our QSA values using Q-learning, um, where now we're going to set our target as being, again, our reward plus discounted future return for you know maximizing your QSS values, um, rather than having a max over your actions here. Um, and we just wanna basically try to iteratively update this QSS value so that it looks more and more like that target. Um, and so the way we represent tau is, is as the, um, so what we're going to try to do is we're going to say, select a state that maximizes my QSS values. Um, and then again, we're going to have an inverse dynamics model that says, given my state in this proposed state coming from tau, which action would 
allow that transition to occur. Um, okay, so uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that um, in deterministic settings, um, so I want to be clear that this this setup only works in deterministic settings. Um, we talk a, a more about that in the paper. Um, but in deterministic settings, QSS and QSA values actually are equivalent. So we'll learn the same values. Um, and so what this heat map is showing is just the learned values within a grid world where an agent needs to navigate to um, a goal here. And you can see here that the value learn values learned by QSA and QSS are indeed um, very similar. Okay. Um, so I just talked about how we can learn QSS in the tabular setting, um, but if we want to get to, you know, more difficult problems where our states are continuous or our, um, our actions are continuous, um, we might not necessarily have access to this neighbor function um, that's going to say, here are all the neighbors um, in, in, from a given state. Um, and so, and, and even if we had that, it, it might be intractable to try to maximize over all of these different states. Um, and also, so before we assumed we had access to this inverse dynamics model, but it could be, I think it's more useful to actually have to learn this because again, it will be difficult to actually have that um, function given to you. Um, and so what I wanna show is that we can um, get rid of this max over the next states um, or this explicit max over the next states. Um, and so if you think about how tau is being represented, what we want is a function that's going to uh, propose states that maximize our QSS values. And that's, that's what tau is. And so if you look at these, um, our formulation for QSS, it needs these states that maximize over um, our QSS values. And so instead of having this explicit max, um, we can just plug in tau um, and get rid of the max anytime we see that sort of formulation. Um, so that happens here as well. So we can get rid of our max and plug in the tau. And um, so if you're familiar with the work, uh, deep deterministic policy gradients or DDPG, this is doing a similar sort of trick, whereas you would, um, you would often see like a policy being used here um, to avoid having to maximize over actions. Um, so now we're just going to be using tau um, to avoid maximizing over our states. So now let's talk about how we can learn this. Um, for again, we're interested in more difficult problems um, where we can't just use a table. Um, so now we're interested in using something like a neural network. Um, and so here, basically our loss is going to be, um, or our target is going to be our reward plus our discounted future return for again, moving to a state that maximizes our QSS values, where now we're going to be plugging in our tau function here. And we just try to minimize the distance between our current prediction of QSS and this target. And again, this is similar to the um, DDPT. Uh, DDPG trick. Um, and now, so in order to learn tau, um, so again, we don't want to actually have to iterate over this neighbor function. Um, but basically, we need tau to make next state proposals that maximize the QSS values. And so we can just have a loss on the negative Q of S and our proposed state coming from tau. Um, and because, you know, we're trying to, uh, or we have a negative on this, um, tau is going to try to um, predict states that maximize QSS because um, we're going to be minimizing this function here. And then finally, in order to learn our inverse dynamics model, um, we can just put a supervised loss on um, our inverse dynamics predictions and the actual um, action that we observe from the environment interactions. Because again, right now I'm talking about um, the online setting where we can actually get access to this data. Um, and so uh, I'll talk about in a bit how we actually um, can remove that assumption. Okay. Um, so one thing I should point out is that actually uh, um, when we first tried out that loss, our approach did kind of terribly. Um, so you can see here that the values were actually being vastly overestimated. Um, and if you look at the trajectory being predicted, um, so this is just showing a grid world. Um, our tau function was predicting states that were well outside of the grid range. Um, and this is sort of a common problem with um, GDPG style approaches or reinforcement learning where, you know, your values are going to be um, often overestimated and our model is learning to exploit that bias. Um, and so what, basically what we had to do was find a way to regularize our model so that it would make reasonable, reasonable predictions um, 
rather than these predictions that just sort of try to exploit the QSS function. Uh, and so the way that we do this is we're going to introduce this sort of cycle loss. Um, so it's, there, there's a lot going on here, but I'll try to break it down a bit. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is we're going to plug our state into our model tau to get a next state prediction. Then we're going to plug that next state prediction along with our current state into our inverse dynamics model in order to get an action. And then we plug that action as well as our state into a forward dynamics model um, in order to get another next state prediction. And what we can try to do is regularize our model to be more consistent with the actual dynamics within the environment. Um, and so we can just have a loss on our next state prediction coming from our model tau and the next state prediction coming from our forward dynamics. Um, and so we can just append that loss to our previous loss that we were using for trading tau. Um, we also found it useful, oh, I should also point out this, that the C function here um, is just describing this whole process here where we're going to be getting out this for dynamics um, state. Um, but yeah, we found it was useful to actually plug that function in anywhere that we saw this um, tau. So that happens here. Um, and it also happens when we're training the, um, we're computing the target for a learning QSS value. So that happens here as well. Uh, and then, so once we once we uh, updated our loss with that sort of regularization, our approach did much better. Um, and so this is just showing the learned values, um, and and now they're no longer being overestimated. Um, and the neighbors that were being predicted by our um, the model tell were no longer being um, uh, get, being placed outside of the grid. And as training went on, you actually see that the predictions become more and more grid like. Which is actually, I mean, that's exactly what you want. But I also think think it's kind of exciting because this model is never getting any actions. Um, it's only being trained to um, basically try to maximize its QSS values, and so now it's actually being able to make these sort of next state predictions. Okay, um, and so I also want to point out that this approach can be used for solving control tasks. Um, so it's not only useful for um, learning from observation, we, we talk about, um, again, in the paper, like a few different um, benefits to it. Um, so we ran it in these um, control tasks. Uh, so this is known as Majoko. Um, it's a sort of common benchmark used in reinforcement learning these days. Um, and so this is just showing that we're able to perform as well as um, the state of the art in several of, of these different tasks, although not all of them. Um, but I still think it's like an exciting result because uh, you know we've, we've introduced this sort of new way of formulating um, Q, uh, Q values, uh, as well as coming up with a policy. Um, and I also think it's exciting because we can use it for learning from observation, which is the point of the talk. Um, so let's get back to that. Um, so now let's just consider how can we transform this sort of um, online learning setup I've just discussed into an offline learning from observation scenario where we don't have access to action. Okay, and so that's the idea behind D3G from observation. Um, where we're going to be given a sequence of observations as well as rewards. Um, and the reason that rewards is, is italicized is that imitation from observation or even imitation learning approaches often don't assume access to the reward function. Um, but in order to learn um, an optimal policy, we assume this um, access to this. And so I think of this more as like a, like a batch or offline reinforcement learning approach, except um, and now we're doing it without actions. Um, so yeah, given that data, we can learn QSS as well as our model tau. And then once we learn that, then we're still going to have the agent take some steps within the environment to try to learn the inverse dynamics. Um, but the benefit of this part, the first step is that our QSS values um, can be learned completely offline. Um, and so the main fix that we need to do, um, so we can still, again, we can, we can compute all of our different losses just from the data offline. Um, and the main thing that's going to be taken out um, is the interactive step. Um, so here you're just saying this is just an on offline um, batch reinforcement learning uh, setup where we don't have access to actions basically. Okay, so one problem um, that we have is that we still need to regularize our model tau. You know, it doesn't, it's not gonna magically work again <laughs> now that we're doing this offline. Um, but the problem is that before we needed access to actions in order to regularize the model. Um, but really the only reason that we needed the actions was that we could, so that we could plug it into um, a forward dynamics model 
in order to predict the next state. Um, and so what we just need to figure out is, is there something that we can plug into our forward dynamics model, but still going to allow us to predict the next state. Um, and it turned out that we could actually use our QSF values here, which is kind of surprising um, because we're learning our QSF values at the same time. And you know, they're, they're not an actual action, um, but it turns out it can sort of act as a, a bit of a unique identifier that's going to allow us to um, predict the next state from a given state. Um, and, and this turned out to work well in practice, even though it seems a little bit surprising. <laughs> um, and so what this is showing here is just um, some random rollouts uh, from inverted pendulum and reacher. And these are again, um, Mujoko tests. So again, if you're going to um, try to train any typical imitation from observation approach using this sort of data, um, it would often do kind of terribly because it, you know, you assume that you have like really good um, uh, demonstrations. Um, but what this is showing here is actually that so um, our model tau is able to, given those random rollouts, it's able to predict solving the task, um, even though it's never seen an optimal trajectory. Um, so you can see here that it's predicting balancing the pull um, and predicting reaching um, this target here. Uh, and I should point out that these trajectories were before the agent ever had um, any interactions with the environment. So this is just the plans being generated by our model tau. Um, after learning offline. Um, and so we also wanted to see um, how well did it do once you placed it within the environment, um, how much reward was it able to achieve? Uh, and so we basically obtained expert um, demonstrations or expert policies and we injected some noise into them. So that's what you're seeing here. So this is when we injected no noise and this is when it was 100% um, random. And we compared again against behavioral coding from observation. Um, so you can see that when, when our policy was actually completely random, um, our approach was able to perform better than behavioral coding from observation, as well as the expert. Um, and you can also see um, an inverted pendulum that was able to achieve the highest possible reward in this scenario. Um, we also see that uh, when there's no randomness injected into the policy, our approach actually does worse <laughs> than behavioral coding from observation. Um, as well as the policy, but I think this is probably because, you know, we're learning these things offline and we need like a good variety of data in order for it to actually be able to um, learn meaningful dynamics um, and value functions. Um, but I still think it's exciting that it's able to learn from completely um, random data. Uh, and finally, we just, um, so what this is showing is just how well does this compare against trading from scratch? Um, <clears throat> So what we see here is the average episodic reward um, per time step, and we compare it against um, again some of the uh, the state of the art in um, one of the state of the art in continuous control. Um, so this is TD3 and DDPG. Um, and so I mean, you would hope that you know learning from observation, a learning from observation approach would perform better than learning from scratch. Um, but what I just want to show is that we're actually able to, as we get um, more and more um, random data, we're able to actually learn to perform better um, than TD3 and uh, DDPG. Um, so this is just telling us that it is actually learning something meaningful offline from the observations, um, even though it's never, um, it wasn't given access to the actions. Okay, um, so what I've just shown is that um, our, our new value function QSS, um, and we introduced this predictive model D, D through G that allows us to maximize these values. Um, and I've shown that this allows an agent to learn um, rather than only imitate from observation. And again, our code is available for this work as well if you're interested in it. Um, and, and now I just wanna conclude with considering, um, you know, if these sorts of approaches can also be useful outside of the you know, typical um, imitation or learning from observation scenario that we might think of, um, and so one scenario I think it could be useful for is something like agent to agent transfer. Um, so you can imagine if you have one agent that has a similar embodiment as another, but maybe somewhat different dynamics, um, maybe you can learn something like a QSS value um, or use some other learning from observation approach to learn um, a value function and then relearn the dynamics function, but still utilize that um, value function in this new environment that you're trying to transfer 
over to, um, which might be a little bit more tricky if you're trying to transfer to um, an environment using a QSA value because you know your action space might be a little bit different. Um, so the QSA value might not necessarily transfer over. Um, Another thing I think this could be useful for is something like uh, sim to real. Um, so in sim to real, you're going to train your agent in simulation um, and transfer it over to the real world. Um, and so again, you can imagine like, well, maybe in simulation, my dynamics um, or the dynamics of a similar simulator might be incorrect, um, but it maybe wants to be transferred into the real world. Um, we can still maybe transfer over our QSS values and just relearn our um, dynamic function. Uh, and finally, I think it could be useful to use like learning or imitation from observation in multi-agent settings um, where you wouldn't necessarily have access to um, the actions of these other um, agents, but maybe you can infer things like policies um, or values of, of the other agents and, uh, and allow that to inform your own policies. Um, so yeah, I, I just want to also conclude with saying, um, you know, this work wasn't done alone. It, it, it took place um, at Uber AI and Georgia Tech with a lot of different people. So I just want to give them a shout out here. Um, and yeah, that's all I have. So thank you all for your attention. Um, I, I guess I probably have time for questions as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's always so weird to give talks in these formats. Um, <laughs> let me uh, ask one of the questions <laughs> from the audience. That was super interesting. Um, one okay. person, Ahmed, said, for interesting research, are you assuming a single expert providing observations and would having observations from multiple experts be useful? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, yeah, so in this work, our expert is actually just so we train a really good policy using reinforcer learning and then use that as our expert. <laughs> um, so we don't actually get like real demonstrations from um, real people. Uh, I think it, it definitely could be useful. I mean, you often have multiple people giving these sorts of demonstrations. Um, I don't know if it would make any, or it would, well, actually, I think it could be helpful because it will give us a good variety of data. Like if somebody, um, you know, always does the same sort of actions, maybe, you know, another demonstrator would give us different kinds of actions. So we, we can get to see these different sorts of transitions that we wouldn't necessarily see if, um, if we had a single person doing the same thing over and over again. Awesome. And I have a question. So um, in the spirit of sort of um, some of the focus of um, uh, a lot of the focus we'll be talking about this fall is going to be theory. And so I was curious, um, are there any hardness results that compare learning from observation to learning from um, settings where you also get the actions? Good question. <laughs> to be honest, I have no idea. I haven't I haven't seen anything. Um, I don't know of any. I think it seems like an interesting question. I know that like I think it was Stefan Ross or no, maybe it's one of Drew Bagnelson. I think when Sun had a little bit of work comparing imitation learning where you do get the actions to RL. Uh, and mm -hmm. the but I don't think I've seen anything for the pure observational setting. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I think there there is a paper on like provably efficient imitation from observation. I think um, from like Byron Boots and I think also the author that you mentioned maybe. Um, there's definitely papers on it, but it's it's not really my area. <laughs> um, another question from Erin. Um, I and uh, they wanted to check. Um, they say that if you were to consider the stochastic setting, learning Q of SS prime would likely be heavily entangled by dynamics in that setting. Is that something mm -hmm. that you said all of the work that you were doing there assumes deterministic settings? Have you guys done extensions or thought about the stochastic setting? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we did run experiments for ILPO with this, actually both ILPO and QSS with um, stochastic dyna dynamics. Um, so I guess, the problem with um, ILPO is that it sort of assumes that um, your dynamics are like the same thing as the policy. <laughs> um, because, you know, if you're, you're saying like, if I end up in this next state, then that's because the policy said it and not because dynamics sort of put me there. Um, and so I think in order to get around that sort of problem, you would need to utilize environment interactions um, to try to figure out how to disentangle the policy from um, from the uh, uh, environment dynamics and without that, our, the approach, it still kind of works, um, but it doesn't do like as well. Um, so, I mean, that's definitely something that's sort of ingrained in the um, formulation. Um, QSS is an, it, so it has a different sort of problem, whereas um, it, it's coming up from that max over next state. 
Um, so it's assuming that it's going to land in the next state, that's optimal. Um, and again, if you, if you have stochasticity, then you're not going to um, necessarily land in that next state that's optimal. Whereas if you're, if you're taking your QSA values, that sort of stochasticity is built into the formulation of um, QSA because um, it doesn't assume what state you end up in basically. Um, so I think that the main difference is that Q, your QSA formulation is taking in your state and the action that you took. Whereas um, uh, QSS is taking into account um, the state and um, the state that you that you end up in. But I think it would be more useful to say, this is the state I was trying to reach. So if I have like given my state, um, this is the state that I wanted to end up in. And then you just plug that into your QSS formulation. Um, then I think it could probably take into account some of the stochasticity of the environment because sometimes you wouldn't end up in that state and you would get a different reward. Um, so it's, it's something that we've looked into. We haven't actually had many experiments with it yet. Um, I definitely think it'll be useful to try to get that to work though. That's super cool. Thanks. Yeah, are there any other questions? I think there are a few on Q and A. Let me see. Um, so one person said, it, um, "Ali said really amazing work. So fascinating by the results and how it remembers batch RL." Um, uh, and he's just really excited to see it trying out. One more other question, which is whether from the same um, from Ali, whether you've tried to use the latents for transfer yet, um, and how well the sort of latent policies learned in one environment might transfer to another environment. He said, I think that's sort of done, already done in coin run, um, but it'd be interesting to see in other games. And I apologize in advance if I yeah. saw here, I, um, I have to be gone, unfortunately, at 4.30, but um, Chapel was here for longer questions as well. And thank you so much for the talk. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much again. Um, it's, it's been a fun, fun experience. Uh, experience. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so let me think. So, so we haven't tried transfer learning um, within um, the latent, uh, so we haven't we haven't done any transfer learning for that. We do have experiments um, within our D3G approach for, um, or actually no QSS approach, um, where we try to transfer to an environment with um, uh, slightly different actions. Um, I mean, it's a very simple environment. So basically, we wanted to transfer from one grid row to the other. Um, they both had similar actions, but they've been relabeled differently. Um, and so you can imagine like if you have a grid world where up is represented by zero and then you transfer it to an environment where up is represented by one or something like that. Um, you know, so QSA wouldn't necessarily work very easily with that, but QSS is, is sort of like part of the, <laughs> the formulation of it that it can handle that. Um, we haven't really tried it in more difficult problems though. Um, I do think it's, it's going to be interesting. There's definitely going to be um, some uh, challenges because uh, so QSS sort of assumes, um, you know, like you're going to give an estate, end up in the same next state. And so if you want to transfer it over to another vi environment, you might not necessarily reach that exact same ne next state. Um, you know, you can imagine like one agent moves faster than the other or slower or whatever. Um, and so I think that you're, in order to get that to work on um, QSS values, as well as how we're learning how to go from one state to the other, um, so rather than using like an inverse dynamics model, we might need to use something like a goal condition policy that says, this is how you get from this state to the next state. Um, but yeah, this isn't, isn't something that we've tried yet, but it's definitely something that we've, we've thought about. Okay, I started to speak. Uh, yeah, very cool, uh, very nice work. Uh, I believe Emmeline Mubai had to leave. Uh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so I'm I'm checking whether there are any more questions. Um, by the way, we do have a Discord uh, server. Uh, you know this chat server. Right. Uh, do you mind uh, checking out whether people want to ask questions later there? Because people, you know, like might go through the talk, uh, we could post your slides there and uh, have some questions mm -hmm. for the week. Uh, I can give you access to yeah, it. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. All yeah, right. yeah, I have access. I'll, I'll post my slides and I can answer questions on there as well. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you so much.
Yeah, I... thank you as well. Yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> All right, yeah. take care. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye.